Welcome back to my two-part series on Inside Number 9. This time we'll be counting down my top five most disturbing episodes, looking at each one in depth and explaining why it gave me the chills. And after reading the responses to part one, I can see that some of these ones definitely got under your skins too. If you missed part one, then don't worry, you can find it linked below. Just to clarify, this is a list of the number 9 episodes I found the most disturbing, not necessarily the all-time greatest or my personal favourites. And, as before, there will be spoilers for every entry, so make sure to watch them before you hear the discussion. You can find the titles and episode numbers in the video description if you don't have time to watch the full thing. Before we start, let's have a quick recap of our list so far. Number 9. Sardines, Series 1, Episode 1 Number 8, Private View, Series 3, Episode 6 Number 7, Seance Time, Series 2, Episode 6 And Number 6, Cold Comfort, Series 2, Episode 4 Now it's time to take a look at the five most disturbing episodes of Inside Number 9 Number 5, Diddle Diddle Dumpling while out jogging, David comes across a lost shoe, UK size 9. It's of good quality and in perfect condition, but the other shoe is nowhere to be found. David soon launches a one-man campaign to find the owner and reunite the pair. But of course, it was never really about the shoe. This episode is a tense and compelling drama, exploring themes of obsession, insanity and grief. David is struggling with an internalised, unspoken pain, one that finds its outlet in strange and irrational behaviour. For the most part, we have no idea why David is suffering, and for all we know, there is no reason. Clearly things are not okay, but nobody will say why. This mood is echoed in the direction and set design, which reminded me of the films of Stanley Kubrick. The sterile, often empty look of the home feels unsettling. The detail inside is meticulous, with a lot of attention drawn to symmetry. Watch it again and see how many objects are shown in pairs. The street number is 22, a pair of twos, and, in this house, even the infamous number 9 hair statue has a twin. By contrast, anything unmatched feels out of place and wrong, hence the fixation on one black man's shoe. Half a pair becomes a source of genuine distress, for reasons that will become apparent later on. We also see shots framed in very deliberate halves, usually when David's mental state is at its most fragile. For instance, here's what we're shown when he finally achieves his goal of returning the shoe to its owner, something he's been obsessed about doing for months. Against all odds, he succeeded. The mystery is solved. And yet, this shot tells us something still isn't right. It's not until the very end that we discover the truth. David is still in mourning for the child he lost six years ago. Joseph, a twin. While his daughter Sally can't remember having a brother, and his wife Louise manages to carry on for their daughter's sake, David remains trapped in a perpetual cycle of sorrow. He tries to move on with the help of those around him, but these efforts ultimately fail. The seasons change, yet David's mental state remains static. There's something uniquely tragic about the loss of one twin. The surviving twin is forever marked by their sibling's absence. Every birthday should be somebody else's. They exist as a living, breathing monument to the deceased. Though David clearly loves his daughter, deep down he knows that his son should be there too, a knowledge that becomes unbearable. In his own words, two halves and one of them's gone. Watch this episode again and you can see David struggle with the stages of grief, only he's projecting all of his emotions onto the shoe. First, there's denial. There can't just be one shoe. It wasn't thrown away. We see anger, mostly directed towards Louise whenever she tries to intervene in his project. He bargains with radio show hosts and anyone who'll listen in a desperate plea to find the shoe's owner. And then there's depression, as David sits alone in the dark, unable to do anything but check for responses. 
he almost reaches a state of acceptance when he hands the shoe over to Ted. Notice how he starts referring to the object as him, as if a subconscious connection is being made between letting go of the shoe and letting go of Joseph. David's relapse and descent into insanity raises some uncomfortable questions. We're often told that time heals all wounds, but what if it doesn't? What if the love and support of those around us just isn't enough? What will become of us if we can't move past the pain of our loss? David's story exposes us to the distress, depression and isolation that bereavement can inflict upon us and the long-term impact it can have on our mental health. Meanwhile, Kaylee Haw's performance depicts the struggle of those around, loved ones who desperately want to help but don't always know how. I also drew a very dark conclusion from the episode's ending. David has blood on his hands, but we don't know where it came from. Most assume that David has injured or killed Ted, but there's another explanation. Before Louise discovers the blood and the police arrive, David starts raving about the shoes and the twins, then calmly states that they should be together. If he's talking about the twins, then one of them is already dead. The question remains, where's Sally? From what I can gather, this was not the conclusion the writers had in mind. A different ending was originally shot, along with an additional scene between David and Sally, but those were ultimately dropped in the final edit. Your mileage may vary on the death of the author, but I believe this interpretation is still valid, based on the ending we got. Remember, two important details were also revealed. That the shoe belonged to David all along, and that he planted it there himself, triggering the chain of events that followed. Was this man unhinged enough to kill his own daughter? Well, if the shoe fits. Number four, the harrowing. Katie arrives at number nine to babysit for Tabitha and Hector Moloch. She spends the night in a freezing Gothic mansion hung with paintings depicting the harrowing of hell. But the real horror lies in wait upstairs, with one thing on its mind, mischief. Let's cut to the chase. I know that the harrowing is not the most popular episode. Lots of fans hate it, and many were disappointed by the ending. But please, hear me out on this one. The writers pay homage to vintage Hammer-style horror, and Rhys Shearsmith teams up with Helen McCrory to indulge in some pure, unadulterated camp. Helen looks right at home strutting about a gothic mansion making catty remarks. I can't think why. Along with their bombastic, over-the-top demeanour, these siblings are unsettling and unpredictable in nature. Much like Edward and Tubbs, and yes, they were also brother and sister, we know that anyone who sets foot on their property will probably never leave. Enter Katie, our ill-fated protagonist. As I've said in the past, horror hates babysitters and wants them all dead. After meeting Andras, who appears to be a dangerously sick man being held against his will, Katie tries to call for help. However, her phone signal is dead, the party line is engaged, and no one at the house has installed board bands. She almost escapes, but is stabbed in the back and the neck by her best friend Shell. The reveal of Andras was a genuinely chilling moment, much like the discovery of Sloth in the movie Seven. The makeup effects are fantastic, and you can practically smell the stench in the room as you watch. His appearance is, in a word, harrowing. The episode ends with Katie locked in his room after being drugged, bound, gagged, and stripped to her underwear. The decrepit and almost naked Andras advances on her with a gleam in his eye, repeatedly hissing the word mischief. And that's it. The credits roll and we're all left in the dark. While the abrupt ending was unpopular, it does leave the story open to several possibilities. Here are three things that I think might happen next. 1. The demon is transferred into Katie. Katie is possessed and her life and youth are taken from her. She's confined to a freezing room for the next 50 years where her body grows warped and wasted. Before she dies, she'll be forced to transfer the demon Cassiel into another host. But how exactly is the demon transferred? 
it might simply jump from one person to another, but this setup implies something more invasive. And let's be blunt, this scene feels more than a bit rapey. Their description of the process is also quite alarming, not unlike giving birth, only the other way round. What does that even mean? From what I've heard, childbirth is no picnic, and the other way round sounds even more horrendous. Put it this way, does anyone else remember that scene from American Gods? The way they present Andras as a grotesque, overgrown infant makes the whole reverse childbirth analogy seem even weirder. It's all left to the imagination, though I'm not sure if that makes things better or worse. 2. The demon isn't real and the Mollocks are insane. If we take the supernatural out of the equation, then the people behind this scheme are either delusional or a pair of sadistic freaks. Tabitha and Hector have spent decades torturing their own brother and now they're subjecting an innocent schoolgirl to some unspeakable real-life horror. Andras may not be possessed, but he still poses a tangible threat to this young girl. He might honestly believe that there's a demon inside him, controlling his actions and yearning to do evil. Plus, the man's mental and moral faculties appear to be long gone. What he does to Katie may be violent, depraved, and possibly sexual in nature. I'll admit, this wasn't something I'd thought about in any depth until a post appeared on the number 9 subreddit, link below. So yeah, cheers for that. I often like to apply at least one real-world explanation to supernatural horror, as you might have guessed from watching my channel, and I think it's one of the most disturbing ways to view this episode. 3. Katie escapes. And then what? Let's imagine Katie breaks free of the restraints, escapes the house, and hopefully manages to grab some clothing on the way. What now? Would anyone believe her story? Or would the poor girl end up being sectioned? Here's a question. Just how many people are involved in this so-called church? Maybe it extends to the whole street, or maybe even the whole town. Perhaps there's no chance of escape, even if she does manage to flee the building. What about Katie's parents? Because if they're not compliant or haven't otherwise been taken care of, the Mollocks will have some serious explaining to do in the morning. But consider this. What if the church was right? What if the sacrifice needed to be made for the good of mankind? If Castiel is set free, then the earth will shortly be plunged into chaos. All hell would literally break loose. Katie's freedom might just doom the whole world. All that being said, it was those last terrifying moments that earned this episode a spot on my list. The way it stopped so abruptly left me in a state of tension and the sight of Andras creeping closer, repeating the word mischief, was left burned into my brain. It was still there when I turned off my TV and, trust me, it was all I could think of when I tried to get to sleep that night. Harrowing indeed. Number 3. The Devil of Christmas a family arrives to spend the holidays at the number 9 ski chalet in what appears to be a low-budget 70s horror. Here they learn about a local legend, Krampus the Devil of Christmas. It's all fun, games and unconvincing props until we reach scene 18b. Before I watched this, my sister, who was the one who got me into number 9, told me that this was the most disturbing episode she'd seen. And for the first 27 minutes, I didn't get why. I thought it was a pastiche of other horror programmes, or a comedy in the style of Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, which I'd highly recommend by the way if you enjoyed this episode. But it ended up on my list for a good reason. Before we get to that ending, let's take a moment to appreciate the effort behind it all. The producer sourced archaic film equipment, along with genuine 1970s costumes and props, and presented it all in that gloriously outdated aspect ratio. Everyone is 100% committed to making the experience feel authentically low rent. As the website Den of Geek put it, these days you have to be very good to make TV that bad. The dialogue reeks of cheese, the acting is hysterically hammy, and the set looks like it's ready to collapse at any second. For fans of nostalgic telly, it's a real good treat. Someone else who appreciates the finer details is the piece's fictional director, Dennis Fulcher. 
He mostly appears in the form of a voiceover, recorded in the present day, and is briefly seen at the end of filming. While his commentary is full of fond recollections and anecdotes, he's also quick to criticise the cheapness and clichés, such as the watered-down Ribena and the inadequate supply of stairs. His tone is charming and wistful throughout, and we can detect a real sense of pride in his creation. Then it hits us. This entire time, we've been watching a snuff film. For those unfamiliar with the term, Snuff describes a movie in which one of the performers is deliberately killed on camera. Films like this were rumoured to be distributed for profit via underground networks in the late 70s and 80s, coinciding with the growth of home video as well as the video nasties panic in the UK. While no such tapes were ever confirmed to exist, several movie makers exploited the Snuff rumour, both in their production and marketing. This led to some unexpected results, as certain viewers became convinced that what they saw had actually happened. This is where the attention to detail really pays off. The Devil of Christmas looks exactly how most of us would picture a real snuff film, being familiar with the urban myth. The time period is spot on, the production feels understandably rushed, and we're treated to some grisly details towards the end, such as the crew rolling out the plastic sheets, and the executioner being prepped for his big scene. Well, it's not like he gets to do a second take. At its core, we have a stellar turn from Jessica Rain as Kathy, or Penny, which was the actual name of the woman involved. She expertly flips from tacky scream queen to genuine blood-chilling terror as she suddenly realises she's about to become the victim of a violent and savage murder. The fact that the rest of her performance felt so artificial makes her reaction in this scene all the more real. This shocking twist also has a unique impact on the audience. It leaves us with a nasty sense of voyeurism. In the silence that follows, we too feel like we've been drawn into something utterly depraved. Did the ending come from nowhere? Well, not entirely, although most of the hints are nearly impossible to spot. The episode's use of uncut footage is not uncommon. We've all seen it in blooper reels, deleted scenes, and in lost episodes, which is what The Devil of Christmas at first appears to be. However, it is unusual to hear director's commentary over partially edited footage, and even stranger that the director is somehow able to rewind the tape as we watch. Something doesn't add up. Another detail, notably absent from the clapperboard, is the TX, or transmission date. The Devil of Christmas is being shot in a hurry, but they're not working towards any provisional air date. Strange, as it's a Christmas episode being shot in December. It would be odd, not to mention prohibitively expensive in those days, to book a set, crew and filming equipment and make something with no plans to have it televised. The lack of TX info is a subtle but tantalising clue. Whatever we're about to watch, it was never meant to be broadcast. When you rewatch the episode, certain comments from the director sound all the more disturbing. While the police already know exactly what they're watching, Dennis talks about it like it was just another TV shoot. There's no shred of remorse for his actions, only for minor production details that might have been improved. He laments that they couldn't get a good child actor, given the subject matter. Also, good lord, they put a child in their snuff film. He even credits himself with having the idea that Kathy was pregnant in order to tee up the ending. That's quite terrifying. Even with the evidence right in front of him, Dennis Fulcher remains emotionally detached from his crimes and shows zero empathy for the woman he had killed. His final remark raises yet more questions. In its defence, it was one of the better ones. So, there were other films like this? How many? Did Dennis make them, or just watch them for comparison? And what, exactly, constitutes a good snuff movie? That's probably something most of us really don't want to know. The Devil of Christmas works on many levels. It's a love letter to the horror anthologies that inspired Number 9, a clever take on a real piece of European folklore and a gruesome urban legend brought horribly to life. Could it be the most disturbing Christmas special ever devised? Well, 
it certainly made my top three. Number two, to have and to hold. Number nine is home to Adrian and Harriet Connor, who are about to renew their wedding vows after two long decades of married life. Harriet struggles to put the spice back in their relationship, assuming it was there in the first place, while Adrian prefers to stay downstairs in his darkroom. But Adrian also hides a dark secret. This episode managed to hit some serious levels of discomfort even before the twist was revealed. The first 18 minutes present us with a harsh, unflinching stare into a relationship gone completely sour. We've seen Steve and Reese making grim jokes about the ugly side of marriage before, if you remember Charlie and Stella, only this time there's no line dancing or Luigi to lighten the mood. It all climaxes, for lack of a better term, in perhaps the most depressing attempt at middle-aged roleplay ever put on camera. Steve claims this was the single hardest scene he's ever had to film, and I can believe that after watching Dick Shafter's appointment with Nurse Honeypot. However, this scene was only a setup for the nightmare that was to come. Feeling rejected, Harriet storms off upstairs with the wine, good call, while Adrian retreats to the basement as usual. He boils the kettle for a pot noodle, takes a key from inside a drawer and moves some equipment to reveal a hidden room. The music turns ominous as Adrian's expression changes. What's he got behind that door? At first I thought, or maybe hoped, that the thing inside the room was a metaphor, an abstract representation of Adrian's repressed emotions and darkest thoughts. I imagined some monstrous entity dragging him away from his loving wife and eating away at his sanity like so many rehydrated noodles. I was so very, very wrong. Behind the door is a woman named Agnes. She has been secretly held prisoner by Adrian for nine years. Worse still, she's not alone. During that time, Agnes has given birth to a child, a boy who Adrian has named Levi. Harriet, meanwhile, has no idea what her husband has done. She remains upstairs, trapped in a joyless marriage, while two innocent people are trapped downstairs in a living hell. Though at first we saw him as a dorky, middle-aged jigsaw enthusiast, Adrian turned out to be one of the most vile characters Number 9 has ever created. When I watched this for the second time, I had to ask, just how did Adrian get away with it for so long? This is something people often wonder about the families and neighbours of criminals. How did they fail to spot the red flags? How could they not know that something was wrong? I mean, seriously, how could you not know? But really, Harriet doesn't have much to go on, and Adrian is a lot more controlling and manipulative than he appears. He has a carefully constructed excuse for every event, allowing him to avoid confrontation and justify his neglect. He needs to stay in the basement in order to make enough money to keep the house, which he must do for Harriet's sake. He quietly chastises his wife for small, insignificant things, such as spending money on makeup, messing up the carpet, or drinking alcohol. He's also very quick to remind her of the one time she was unfaithful, which probably wouldn't have happened had he not made her married life so utterly miserable. But the point is, she did it, and now deeply regrets her actions. Harriet's lingering guilt is a convenient tool that can be used against her whenever she steps out of line or gets too close for comfort. This is how Adrian hides in plain sight. Just like his jigsaw puzzle, the image we see on the box bears no resemblance to the one inside, leaving those around him to work in the dark. The truth is too awful and too shocking to even be considered. So Harriet carries on. She respectfully leaves her husband alone to his work. She goes to bed alone at night. She dutifully buys him pot noodles with no idea what they're actually for. I also wanted to talk about the final scene, which takes place four months after Harriet's discovery and Adrian's accident. Despite the horrors they have both endured, Agnes and Levi are still at the house, and Agnes even continues to do the cleaning. That might seem odd at first, but when you think about it, it starts to make more sense. 
You see, Agnes can't just walk into a normal life. Adrian has taken that from her. She won't be able to get a job or rent a flat without accounting for her whereabouts over the past nine years. During that time, she hasn't used a bank account or paid taxes and her passport will have most likely expired. By this point, she's been missing long enough to have been declared legally dead. And what about Levi? It's unlikely that his birth was registered, so nobody knows that the child even exists. He's had no contact with the outside world and has spent his life in a dark and dirty cellar, fathered by the monster who kept his mother prisoner. How do you discuss the awful realities of Levi's past? And how does he even begin to adjust to a normal life? In order to move out, obtain their documents and start life over again, Agnes would first have to go to the police. But that's not as easy as it sounds. She'll have to recount every detail of her ordeal, living the nightmare all over again. There would be medical examinations, legal proceedings and, more than likely, media attention. All the sordid details of her kidnapping would be made public and nothing would ever be normal again, not for Agnes or for Harriet or their friends and families. They face being hounded by the press for years to come, and with a young child involved, that's a very worrying prospect. Maybe Agnes just isn't ready. Maybe she feels safe around Harriet, who's the only one who knows what she's been through and is still dealing with her own trauma. Maybe doing the housework gives Agnes some sense of normality in a life that's been anything but. Cleaning might even be therapeutic after spending nine years living in a filthy basement. Or it might just be a small way of showing gratitude to the woman who rescued them. And of course, there's another issue. What to do about Adrian. Harriet has decided to keep him alive and has given him a small taste of the suffering and degradation he has inflicted. Well, this complicates things ever so slightly. Few would argue that Adrian deserves his punishment. Whatever happens from this point onward, one thing is certain. I'll never look at a pot noodle in the same way ever again. Before I reveal my number one episode, let's take a brief look at my three honourable mentions. I might revisit these episodes in a future video, so let me know in the comments if that's something you'd like to see. First up, Tom and Jerry. A great episode and one that definitely merits a second viewing. Like so many people, I thought I had the twist all figured out, but in the end, they proved me wrong. Consider this my number 10. Next up, we have the series 4 finale, Tempting Fate. It's the monkey's paw meets extreme hoarders in a classic, careful what you wish for narrative. Another great episode that just missed the cut, and it's always nice to see Neil from The Young Ones making an appearance. Plus, I must say, that was one hell of a bleak ending. And finally, we have the standalone episode, Deadline. Can I just say, I really wish I watched it live. The concept was so well executed, and the idea was incredibly bold, and I wish I'd done it justice and experienced it properly, because watching it on catch-up kind of ruined the impact for me. But there's still plenty going on that's worthy of discussion. Maybe it'll turn up in a future video, or maybe Deadline deserves one of its own. Again, if that's something you'd like to see, then please let me know. So here it is, the most disturbing episode of Insight number 9. Number 1. The Riddle of the Sphinx A young woman, calling herself Nina, is caught breaking into the office of Professor Nigel Hector Squires. She claims to be trying to solve a puzzle, but the answers might just take her breath away. This is, without a doubt, the most twisted and ingenious half hour of TV I have ever watched. It's a story about crosswords. It's also a tale of murder, betrayal, revenge and suicide that still leaves me reeling every single time I watch. The threads of this plot are carefully crafted and woven together, much like the cryptic puzzle set by Professor Squires, aka the Sphinx. And it's doubly fascinating and disturbing once you realise who's been holding the cards the entire time. It starts out innocently enough. 
Squires is captivated by the young intruder and starts showing off his crossword skills, eager to teach her and the audience how to solve the cryptic clues. Fun fact, Steve Pemberton actually set the crossword himself and had it published in the previous week's Guardian newspaper. I must confess, I did have a go at some cryptic crosswords after watching this, but I guess some wild creatures cannot be taught. Anyway, back to the plot. So far, so Pygmalion. But this playful scene hides a deadly battle of wits, riddled with deception and devious minds. Points to note include the following. 1. Nina, real name Charlotte, is about to poison the professor. 2. Squires already knows this and is about to trick her into drinking the wrong cup. 3. Squires sees no problem in taking advantage of a girl who's paralysed. And 4. That's your daughter, Squires, you creepy old bastard. That last fact is something neither of these characters will know until the very end, but it does make his seemingly harmless flirtations all the more revolting. Even if they weren't related, his actions are still predatory, and my skin would still crawl every time he calls her Nina Dear. Next, we get some horrifying and accurate details of pufferfish poisoning. Turns out the Simpsons got it wrong. This method of death, I thought, was especially horrific. True, someone dies in nearly every episode of number 9, but it's rarely so prolonged or described in this much detail. Well, she spends the rest of the episode paralysed, with a look of pain and terror in her still open eyes, we know exactly what's happening to Nina on the inside. As we watch the drama unfold, her organs start to fail and death from asphyxiation grows imminent. She may, or may not, already be dead by the end of the episode. Nina's struggle to save herself beforehand is also quite distressing to watch, and that panic is probably still happening inside her brain. While the weapon was concealed in a nice and very British cup of tea, there was nothing refined about seeing Nina crawling on the floor trying to make herself sick, before falling back into the clutches of the creepy professor. But the real turning point occurs with the introduction of our mystery guest. I want you to eat her. We soon realise that Tyler is deadly serious. He calmly prepares the small cooking stove and unveils his surgical tools before offering Squires his choice of cut. Nina, all the while, remains fully aware of everything that's happening but is powerless to react. She can, as Tyler helpfully reminds us, still hear, see and feel everything, but cannot move or even scream. While many number 9 episodes are disturbing because of what we don't see, that isn't the case in the riddle of the Sphinx. We see it all. The cutting, the cringing, the crying. We hear oil and flesh sizzle on the pan as Tyler prepares the slither of meat. He even describes the taste, or at least a supposed approximation of it. Finally, we get that sickening crunch as Squires, half gagging, half sobbing, consumes poor Nina's cooked flesh. The whole scene was so gruesome that it nearly made me vomit. So, let's talk human cannibalism. This is a seldom explored topic that provokes a special level of fear and disgust. It's how a fairly minor character from a Thomas Harris thriller became one of the most terrifying villains of all time. Apart from being taboo in almost all modern cultures, cannibalism forces us to consider ourselves in two different but equally terrible lights. As savage beings who'd willingly devour and desecrate the corpses of our loved ones, and as our own living bodies being reduced to potential meat. Strip away the thin veneer of civilization, and humanity becomes both the prey and the predator. The riddle of the Sphinx concludes with the professor's suicide. Finally understanding what he's done, and who he's done it to, Squires breaks down and weeps before his dying daughter, before sticking Chekhov's loaded gun in his mouth. And if you thought the next part would be left to the imagination, wrong again. We briefly see the writing on the wall, rest in peace Nigel Hector Squires, before the shot is fired and bits of brain, skull and hair become splattered across his final puzzle. 
I guess that answers the question. What's black and white and red all over? As if this gruesome content wasn't enough, the plot grows even more disturbing once you understand who all these characters are. For instance, the scene where Squires gropes and kisses the paralysed Nina, which was already horrible, also happened to be a scene of incestuous lust. He kills his own daughter when he switches the poison cup, and that victory he stole in the crossword competition caused his own son to hang himself. Yet another death by asphyxiation. But while this family drama might look shocking or sensationalist on paper, it all ties in very neatly with the premise of a Greek tragedy. This is quite deliberate. Early on, we're introduced to the legend of the Sphinx, plus the episode makes several references to the Sophocles play Oedipus Rex. The story of Oedipus saw the main character kill his father and sleep with his mother, all the while unaware that these were his parents. The Riddle of the Sphinx works as an inverted reimagining of this classic tale, as Squires unknowingly brings about the death of his son and daughter, as well as making sexual advances towards the latter. He remains blind to the truth until it is too late. But for me, re-watching the episode, the real monster turned out to be Dr. Tyler. After all, Tyler had the whole event planned from the very beginning. Before Nina arrived, he'd revealed just enough information to Squires to trick him into incriminating himself. He also gave the false impression that Nina would be saved and that he'd provide the antidote. Worse still, he willingly used the girl he raised as his own daughter as a disposable pawn in his sadistic play. The reason? To punish Squires and make him suffer. This is Tyler's revenge. But what is his revenge in aid of? At first, I thought it was for Simon, Nina's deceased twin. But on second thoughts, I'm not so sure. Look at how the doctor treats her, butchering her in cold blood, then feeding her flesh to a man he despises before leaving her to die. No last words, no goodbyes. It's as if Tyler stopped caring about his daughter the moment he realised that she was not his biological child. Neither was Simon, so I doubt Tyler would be doing this all for his sake. From what I can tell, Tyler genuinely cared about two things, his marriage and his career. Even though he found a job in academia and a family in Simon and Charlotte, it wasn't enough. Tyler wanted what Squires had and that resentment never left. Notice how he mentions the word cheating an awful lot. While I initially thought he was talking about Simon's competition, I think it's a bit more personal. Tyler feels cheated out of his ambitions, as he stands in the office that he notes should be his. And of course, Squires was the one who cheated with his wife. Dr Jacob Tyler is cold, calculating and, to my mind, the most disturbing character the show has produced. That he could even think of such a scheme, never mind actually doing it, reveals a level of sadism most of us could scarcely even imagine. The torture he inflicts, driven by hatred and jealousy, was also carefully planned. Every instance of suffering was his by design, and in the end, he walks away with his hands clean. Crazy, isn't it, what the unhinged mind is capable of? So those were the top 9 most disturbing episodes of Inside Number 9. I know different people are affected by different episodes and I'd love to hear about the moments that disturbed you the most. Please share your opinions in the comments below and of course feel free to disagree with my lists, we're all number 9 fans here. So then, dear subscribers, what do you think I should look at next? I've got a few movies, TV shows and even a few creepy web series in mind for the future but I'm always open to suggestions. Please don't hesitate to get in touch with your recommendations. Before I go, I'd like to say a huge thanks to all the people who watched and shared my last video, including my new subscribers. Hi guys, great to have you on board. Big shout out to Jen for getting me into number 9, to Thomas who created that amazing music you've all been listening to, and finally to the League of Psychos Inside Number 9 Facebook group. Great bunch, right good sense of humour. And finally to Steve Pemberton and Rhys Shearsmith. Please keep making this show forever.